Okay, so let's start by looking at conflict. Conflict is a part of life. That's not to say it's bad. Conflict is part of how we establish our interests and how we form our relationships. And basically, without a certain measure of conflict, no relationship is possible. Certainly not one that is uh, symbiotic or mutualistic. So we must, uh, we must realize that it is part of life, and how we manage it is, of course, relevant. Now, there's a lot of conflict that can happen in families. We certainly have the various opportunities for conflict at work, in the medical and the health profession. There are all kinds of opportunities to have disagreements and, and try and work together. And in fact, there's not any community where one doesn't have a certain amount of conflict. And this is uh, by an anonymous author in, relate, uh, in relation to a community of faith, where he says, well, to dwell above with the saints we love, that will be grace and glory, but to live below with the saints we know, that's another story. So, yes, getting along with each other is a major, major challenge. Without it, nothing works, but with it, we can do incredible things together. And life takes on a wholesome, a wholesome dimension. And what sets the stage apart when we're looking at patient care is that we basically all want the same thing. So our goals aren't truly in opposition of one another, as they often are in other situations. But here our goals, in many respects, are the same. And that, I think, is one of the biggest advantages. Now, one of the disadvantages is that all the relationships aren't horizontal. In other words, you may have a subordinate relationship to someone within the hierarchy or the, the service that you work, and that can be challenging. We've got different people with different views, with different, different cultural backgrounds that introduce uh, communication challenges, sometimes in language, sometimes in ethnicity, sometimes in background. And truth be told, it's a miracle that we ever see eye to eye, because we are unique in many respects. So what I've found over the years, the pivotal tools that have helped me in managing conflict relationships are the ones I'll actually be sharing with you, uh, from a pragmatic point of view, a way to collaborate with people and to, to figure out how to get the best out of them. So that's where I'm coming from with this. And maybe just to introduce it briefly and to allow you a moment of self-reflection, I'm going to give you a couple of statements which are not unusual for people in the healthcare professions as they describe their relationships with colleagues and patients. So perhaps you can identify with some of them. First one, I tend to do my own thing because it's just too much of a battle to get people to cooperate. Or I demand what people's job requires from them. As for the rest, I take what I can get. I always try to be nice, but people better not rub me up the wrong way. Then I'll let them have it. I really enjoy working with colleagues. It's rare for me to have such a disagreement that we cannot work through it. Or I try to develop and introduce care plans that require the least amount of compliance from my patients because they rarely give it anyway. I lay down the law, and if patients don't accept it, I refuse to treat them. I tend to give my patients a bit of time to cooperate, however, if they continue to refuse, I refer them elsewhere, refuse further care. I'm usually able to reach agreement with my patients on their care and monitor the outcome with them. Could you identify with any of these statements, even if you wouldn't want to admit it publicly? You know, sometimes we feel one way, but you know, in the end we, we behave as we expect we should or as we believe we should. But the reality is all of these are a form of conflict, and most of them are unresolved conflicts. So my objective is really to give you the tool to not see conflict as your enemy, but as your friend. And to see conflict as an opportunity to improve relationships, not to destroy them. Because that's what conflict should be. It's face to face. That's what the word means. Unfortunately, we sometimes go into conflict, guns blazing, with a conversation that started in our head half an hour before we met with a person. And we just keep on with the conversation without them having had the benefit of the first 30 minutes in your head. And then we wonder why they don't know what you're trying to say. So let's start with that, and I'm going to introduce Crucial Confrontations as the first book. But if you can get the audio book or the hard copy, 
It's easily available on Amazon. It's really a wonderful investment. And I'll only be able to give you some principles from this, but I encourage you to get it and to work through it. It works on three principles. And the first one is that you start with yourself. Something's happened, there's been a violated expectation, there's been an unacceptable behavior, there's been someone who's delinquent in their duties, and you now need to decide, what am I going to do? And the first thing you need to do is to work on yourself and decide if you should confront it, and usually the answer is yes, because otherwise you go into sort of a passive-aggressive mode and you've got the strained relationship. So for the most part, you do need to deal with it, unless it's really trivial. But the second thing, which I'll unpack in a moment, is what the actual issue is. And I'll explain why that's important. The next one is, there is no conflict. There is no confrontation, I should maybe say rather, that will resolve anything unless it occurs in the framework of safety. In other words, unless you establish a safe environment, confrontation will not have the outcome you want. Now that's not to say that there won't be unsafe confrontations, but what I am saying is that if you desire a confrontation to have a positive outcome, that is impossible without establishing safety. And if safety is breached, if someone's back gets up, if their you know, neck veins bulge and their eyes go big, the right thing to do is to stop the confrontation there and to say, let's just cool down and we'll come back when we can make it safe. And we need to understand that you cannot have a constructive confrontation if it's unsafe. Then the last thing is you obviously need to introduce a plan. But to understand what plan is needed, you need to differentiate what the problem is. I know that's abstract, so let me drill into this a little bit more. I'll start with the first one, which is the what if question. What is actually the problem? And we tend to focus on individual behavior. And I'll use an example to make it practical. Someone's late, late for work. The truth is that they have been late several times, and because they know you, you're starting to think they're abusing your generosity in basically condoning or at least overlooking the fact that they're doing it. So if this happens, there is a tendency to focus on the day you're really cross and they are late. So you start the discussion, why are you late today? And they say, well, sorry, the bus and the this and the that. The point is at that stage, you're no longer really cross about the behavior. In fact, you're not even cross about the pattern of behavior. They're regularly late. You're already at the point where the relationship is in jeopardy. You follow what I'm trying to say? In other words, if you argue that I was late, I wasn't late, or the bus, or it was this, or it was that, and you argue about the behavior, you're missing the point. Even if you convince them that they were wrong, you haven't fixed the relationship that's damaged, and that's the actual problem. So the conversation would have to start in, I want to talk to you about something that's really bothering me is now a convenient time. Otherwise, we can schedule it later, but we do need to talk about it. And then when you have the opportunity, you would say, I value our relationship, I value our friendship, I value your role that you play in the organization, but I have difficulty understanding something. Can we please talk about it? Now, you've done a couple of things. Firstly, you have immediately focused on the relationship, which means an argument about today's behavior is already beyond argument. Okay? Otherwise, you're just going to debate the behavior. And that is not going to achieve resolution. So you have to identify, is it the behavior, is it the pattern of behavior, or is it the implications in the relationship or on the relationship? You have to know what you're actually trying to reconcile. And then before you go in with your guns blazing, you need to ask yourself an important question. Why would a perfectly normal, sane individual behave this way? Because you know the story in your head is, they're always doing this. They're never mindful of me. They never consider me. They're ungrateful. You know, you already start building an ugly story in your head. And when you meet with them, you're already sort of restrained in your anger. And they can see right through that. It creates an unsafe environment. So unless you, in your own head, say, well, why would a perfectly normal person do this? 
you're going to go in with the wrong attitude, with an agenda, and it's going to go south. And then you need to ask yourself, well, what's it really about? Don't they want to do it? Or don't they know how to do it? And unfortunately, people often mislead each other about that. In other words, someone who doesn't know how to work with Excel will frequently say, well, I just don't feel like doing these reports. But the reality is they don't know how, and they're too ashamed to ask. And if you don't have a safe conversation, you'll never know. And on the other hand, there's someone who's actually got a motivation problem, but they say, well, I don't know how to do it. I don't have access. I don't, can't remember the password. So they'll pretend an ability issue when it's really a motivation issue. And unless you know which it is, you're not going to have the right strategy. These people need their motivation supported. These people need their ability built. And if you don't know what it is, you're not going to resolve the conflict. And then the last part just is how do you make it safe? And safety always starts with relationships. We value you. We want to include you. This is not about terminating your position. This is not about me having it out with you. It's not about this. It's not about that. What it is about is we need to work together. Can we have this discussion? It has to start there. And then in terms of how you frame the negative consequences, the best is to use natural consequences. In other words, not if you do that, then I am going to have to. You would say, if you do this, you would not meet the requirements of your position. You would no longer be in conformance to the policy of this hospital. You will no longer be able to be accepted by your peers. You will no longer be able to have access to care. Natural consequences rather than you punishing the individual. You follow the difference. We do it with our kids as well. We do it with our kids. You, you're going to get grounded. You're going to get this. Don't tell me I'm cross with you. That's the boundary. If you run into the fence, don't be surprised when it you know, cuts into you. So you make it a natural consequence. There's a lot more to this, but in the interest of time, because I want to get to the thinking hats, I just wanted to give that introduction. The next one is about principle-based negotiation. And principle-based negotiation has nothing to do with the moral aspects of it, although I believe it is a moral framework. But it's actually a Harvard negotiation group that were very actively involved with the negotiations in the Middle East at the time of the Sinai Peninsula crisis. And they studied, ultimately, what were the tipping points in the conversations. And I'm going to keep it really, really simple. There's a mind map you can look at. You'll get the slides. Relax. I'm going to break it down into the core steps, just so that you are able to frame it if you enter into a negotiation. The first thing, and the acronym SIPO is something you might be able to remember, the first thing is you need to realize, first and foremost, anybody in a negotiation is firstly human. So they've got human interests, human emotions, human baggage, human agendas, human this, that, and the other. So that is part of what comes to the table. But that part is not necessarily the same as what is being debated. Let me give you an example. Let's say a husband and wife have a breach in their relationship and they start arguing about the car or the car maintenance. You can figure out the plan for the car maintenance but it's not going to solve the issue because the actual issue is behind the scenes. It's the relational problem. Okay? Does it mean the car isn't an issue? Of course the car is an issue. But no amount of talking about the car is going to deal with the real problem. So you have to understand what the issues are and you need to separate them. The human issues you need to identify and separate from the actual discussion. You follow what I'm saying? We need to do that and we often don't. And we lump in the whole emotional bundle with the problem together. The second thing is that we have to identify what people's interests and fears actually are. Because one, they often don't communicate it. And two is that they don't always know. So how you deal with that is you ask the one party, explain to me what the problem is. And I'm going to repeat to you what I understand you are saying the problem to be. And you can continue explaining to me what the problem is until what I'm telling you is what you need me to understand. 
Do you follow what I'm saying? In other words, until I can say back to you what you've told me the problem is, I haven't heard your problem. And in the process, the person actually starts understanding their real concern. Do you follow what I mean? The principle is that unless the person feels understood, their interests are not represented. And you have to work with what the interests are. The third thing is you need to create a space in which possibilities can be discussed without the person feeling they're compromising themselves. What I mean by that is, what you need to say is, why don't we just do a couple of what-ifs? I'm not going to hold you to that. It's not as if you're going to compromise the strength of your position or give up your rights to X, Y, and Z, but let's work a couple of possibilities. Just to talk about what could be done without jeopardizing what you're insisting on at the moment. Let's just look at what is. And then the final one is, once you reach the stage where something needs to be done or something needs to be implemented, you draw on objective criteria. What's the norm? What's usual and customary? What's happened in the past? What are other people doing? In other words, that you have a benchmark as a frame of reference. It's not just floating in the air, because otherwise there's always the feeling that there's a certain amount of unfairness. And then it's basically a time of cheating between two periods of fighting. You follow what I'm trying to say? I know I'm covering a lot of terrain here, but the principles, I hope, I'm conveying. So realize the humans are involved, there are emotions, there's baggage, and you need to separate what you're talking about, the issue, from the human baggage behind it. What are the interests and fears truly, so that both parties understand them, create a space for discussion, and ultimately use objective comparisons for what would be considered reasonable. Right, now the last one, and I think this is the one that you might be able to actually immediately put in use with the, the discussion you have after this. Edward Abono is perhaps best known, a social psychologist who coined the term lateral thinking. You know, out of the box lateral thinking, it's attributed to a large extent uh, to some of his work. And the concept of the thinking hats has to do with the role or mode you play subject to what you've got in your head. So if you're a king, you wear a crown. If you were this, you wear a, you know, that sort of hat. The priest wears one kind of hat. And the principle behind it is the hat designates your role, but not necessarily your identity. Let me give you an example of how it co could come through. I could tell you, why don't you use your brain for a change? Or I could say, how about we put on our thinking caps? Okay. Do you see the difference? In other words, I'm not making it personal. You're a bad person. You don't have good insight. You're a numbskull. I'm saying, how about we change the flavor of the discussion and you assume a role which will fit into the sequence of what we're trying to achieve? Do you follow the difference? It's far less threatening. It's far less offensive. So what he came up with, just to make it more memorable, is colored hats. And you'll see the colors make it very intuitive to know what's, what's happening. And I'll give you, I'll just run through them, and then I'll give you examples. There's a map that you can go back to. Don't worry about the details. Just get the principles first. We're going to start with the blue one, because the blue one is the big picture. In other words, why are we here? What's the agenda? What's the goal? What do we want to walk away with? And in the case of the discussion you want to have is, you want to have this position document. You want to have a statement. You want to have some manifesto or a mandate with which to move forward. So that's the blue hat component. Then you've got the, the white hat. The white hat is what are the facts? Just the facts. Neutral. No interpretation, no opinion. The only thing you might modify is, well, it's proven, or we're not sure yet, but it's factual. Unemotional, factual is the white hat. Then you've got the black hat, and the black hat is the one that we as professionals usually default to first. Negative, cynical, seeing all the problems that could be there based on your own hard-earned experience and seeing all the flaws. Now, there's a place for it, don't get me wrong. But if that happens at the stage where you're supposed to have creative ideas, that's the end of the discussion. Someone's going to say, well, what about this? No, man, that's not going to work this way because this and this and I tried it and it never worked. 
So you had someone trying to say, look, I've got a green hat. And the black hat just said, Pfft. that's the end of it. And because it's out of sequence, you don't get the flow of discussion. Do you follow where I'm going with this? Okay, so that's the black hat. And I already gave you a sense of what the green hat is. The green hat's the lateral. How can we grow this? What other possibilities are there? You know, no idea is stupid. Come ye all. Write it on the whiteboard. Anything goes. Nobody's going to be critical. Just, just go there. The yellow hat is the one where you grow the ideas or the possibility and, okay, well, this sounds good. Let's develop that a bit further. And the red hat is the one where you come with all the raw emotion. I'm really passionate about this. I'm really cross about this. This just feels wrong. Okay? That's where you use that language. Okay, so with that overview, let's drill into them again. The blue hat. So this is where you would start with a discussion. And he would say, okay, what's the big picture here? We want to have an impact in diabetes. Here's a strategy. A lot of people are dying. There's no insulin. We want to find a strategy to deal with this. The outcome we want is a document that can be moved forward. We can use it to lobby with government. We can use it to lobby with medical aid or whatever. That's the big picture. That's where we're going, people. That's the map. That's the focus. Now, what do we know? Well, there's this report, there's this data, we know that it works here, we know it doesn't work there, there's this article, there's that. Great. Proven, unproven. Then, Red Hat. I tried to speak to Prof Bongo Bongo in Dingle Dingle, and they didn't want to use it. And the monofilaments are lying in the cupboard, they're not using it because the staff said they don't want to use it, they don't have enough time. Okay, Red Hat time, that's good, go for it. Then, after that, okay, we heard that. So what's wrong? What, what are the flaws in our approach? What are the things that aren't working? No, okay, that's the red hat stuff. What is the actual, true, experience-based concern we have? That's the black hat. The analytical critical, not the emotional critical. The analytical critical. So distinguish those two. There's a time for the red hat. But then you move to the black hat. And once everyone has had their say, then you say, okay, but how can we turn this around? How can we use this as an opportunity? How can we create a different environment? And once one has set that stage, you can now invite creativity. So you can then say, okay, well, let's think out of the box, guys. Whatever, any idea, pop it, pop it, pop it. It's safe. Nobody's going to think you're a fool. And once that's in, then we need sanity at the end with the blue hat to say, okay, We've looked at everything, we've discussed everything, now what are we going to do? Okay. Now can you understand the difference? If someone now, let's say I were to make, an, or make a proposal or suggest something, and someone immediately starts and says, well that's not going to work, we try and say, can you just take the black hat off for a moment? I just want to first give you the blue hat framework, then we can get to that. I've not insulted you, I haven't said your you know, you don't have a valid opinion. I'm saying just please postpone that input until the time when it will fit in the flow of discussion. Otherwise, we're going to start nitpicking around the black hat stuff, and I haven't even told you the blue hat picture. And it's wonderful if everybody understands the language. And I've run workshops with diving fatalities where everybody was cross with each other, and this one party wanted to sue that one, and I said, guys, let me give you the framework in which this is going to happen. I couldn't believe how well behaved the people were. Because they knew there was going to be a time that they could blast it. The red hat time was coming, the black hat time was coming, but not immediately. Okay? Not immediately. Hold the black hat. Hold the red hat. Let's start with the blue hat. We're all on the same page. We're all on the same team. We all want the same thing. So let's start there. And that's incredibly powerful. So when it comes to confrontations, when there's something that is a breach in relationship, whether it's in terms of job description, whether it's in terms of your own relationship or whatever, the first thing is to ask, is it something that I need to deal with? I mean, is the cap that's left off the toothpaste really that important to confront? You know, is it? And if it is, then you need to ask yourself why. Because chances are it's not about the toothpaste. It's not about the toilet seat. It's about what that says or does to the relationship. If you don't put it back on, you don't love me. Okay? Or this is a gender thing that you don't put the seat down. 
It's not about the behavior. It's not even about the pattern. It's about the relationship. And unless you deal with it at the right level, even if you win, you lose. You have to deal with it at the level it's at. Master your stories. Why would a perfectly sane, normal individual do this? Is it a motivation problem? Or is it an ability problem? Because then that's what we need to deal with. And then lastly within this, how do we make it safe? I want our relationship to work. I value your input. There's this issue that I want to talk about. Can we? And if we start getting upset, we can postpone it. But we need to. We need to work through this thing. And the people who did this research found that where managers did this, the relationships were not only resolved, they were improved. People actually felt safe, cherished, valued, and wanted to contribute. It's not about just getting your way. It's actually about getting your collective way. Getting to yes, in summary again, separate the people from the issues. Humans versus the issue. What do they, what do they want and what are they afraid of? And make sure both parties understand. What are the possibilities in safety? And then what is reasonable by an objective metric? And lastly, we looked at the hats, starting and ending with a blue hat, so big picture, data, emotion, critical thinking, positive opportunities, creative solutions, wrap up. And I invite you to try it, maybe, because it gives us language. It gives us a way to understand our thinking, reflect on our thinking, and share our thinking in a collaborative way, in a dignified way that allows us to stay in step with the ultimate goal of achieving a common objective. Okay, that's it for me.